This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. When you get right down to it, horror is a way of contextualizing fear. It gives name and shape to those big existential dreads lurking in the backs of all our minds. Vampires and werewolves are the primal, untamed aspects of nature and our psyches, zombies embody the catastrophic collapse of civilization, and slasher killers are the inescapable after-effects of past sins or traumas. But like a lot of things, our fears are shaped by the times and cultures we live in, which in turn shapes horror stories, as demonstrated by the evolution of the tale of Sweeney Todd. So let's look back at the demon Barbara Fleet Street's big debut in the penny dreadful The String of Pearls. The provenance of this story is a little murky. It was published in serial form between 1846 and 47 and as a book in 1850, but sources differ on whether the author was Thomas Peckett Prest, James Malcolm Reimer, and or someone else entirely. There are also some claims that it's based on a true story, but based on an urban legend is probably closer to the truth. Stories about food vendors using unorthodox sources for their meat have a long and proud history. Charles Dickens features such rumors in the Pickwick Papers and Martin Chuzzlewit. And sensationalized crime stories are easy to spread and hard to fact check. The plot may have also drawn inspiration from tales of a clan of cannibals headed by a sawny bean. So here's how it originally went down. It's 1785, and Sailor Lieutenant Thornhill arrives in London on a sad mission. His shipmate and friend, Mark Ingestry, has been lost at sea and is presumed dead, and Thornhill has come to deliver the news to Mark's sweetheart, Joanna Oakley, along with a valuable string of pearls Mark had procured as a gift. But en route, Thornhill stops for a shave in the Fleet Street parlor of Sweeney Todd and vanishes. Literally, one minute he's in the barber's chair, next he's gone. Luckily, Thornhill has one of those loyal, smarter-than-many-humans dogs who runs back to the ship and arouses the suspicions of the captain and another passenger, an army man named Colonel Jeffrey. Jeffrey apprises Joanna of the situation and investigates with the captain, and while it's not quite clear what Todd's up to, there's plenty of evidence that something nefarious is afoot. Sweeney's abused shop boy, Tobias Ragg, discovers a room full of boots, canes, and other valuable accessories. Mrs. Lovett's pie shop down the road does a thriving business, but her cook is kept imprisoned in the basement, and a putrid stench is emerging from the vaults below St. Dunstan's Church. Eventually, Joanna, who is convinced that the missing Thornhill is her beloved Mark under an assumed name, disguises herself as a boy and takes a position in Sweeney's establishment, filling a vacancy left when Tobias was thrown in an asylum for accusing his employer of murder. There, she is able to help Jeffrey and the local magistrate get to the bottom of things. It turns out that Sweeney's barber chair is one of a matched set on a rotating trap door, and when a suitably wealthy customer comes in, he activates the pivot and drops him into the cellar below. Anyone who manages to survive being dropped a couple stories directly on his head is dispatched with Sweeney's razor, and the flesh from the body is chopped up and deposited in Mrs. Lovett's pantry, with the unusable parts left to decay below the church. Mrs. Lovett's cook, revealed to be Mark himself, escapes by riding up the dumbwaiter into her shop, where he announces to her horrified patrons what the secret ingredient is. Lovett is poisoned by Todd so he won't have to divide the spoils with her, but he is swiftly arrested, convicted of a couple hundred murders, and hanged. Joanna and Mark are reunited, and they marry and live the happy existence they've earned through the trials they endured. Reading The String of Pearls after studying Sondheim's Sweeney Todd for years is a bit disorienting. The names and general concept of the story are all there, but the particulars are very different. It's not even set during the Victorian era, but during the earlier reign of George III. Most notably, there's a lack of any moral gray area. The protagonists are uniformly noble paragons of society, Joanna in particular is as virtuous a gothic heroine as you're likely to encounter, while the villains practically give off auras of obvious evilness. Todd and Lovett aren't motivated by righteous vengeance and unrequited love respectively, they're just thieves with a rather grotesque method of body disposal. So, how did Sweeney Todd go from brutish mugger to Count of Monte Cristo? Enter Christopher Bond. 
In the 1970s, Bond adapted Sweeney Todd with a view of reclaiming melodrama from the self-parody the genre had devolved into. The idea was to create a story that, while it featured larger-than-life characters and broad passions, still retained elements of humanity and dramatic truth. The result was something that Stephen Sondheim and Hugh Wheeler stuck very close to when writing the musical adaptation. Sweeney's backstory of unjust imprisonment, Joanna being recast as his long-lost daughter, Judge Turpin, Pirelli, the mysterious beggar woman, and the rest. And it also provides an interesting indication on changing cultural perspectives. The String of Pearls and its subsequent adaptations share common roots for their horror, the taboo of cannibalism, the abuse of the mentally ill, and the dehumanizing aspects of an industrialized society that turns us all into so much meat for the grinder. But the String of Pearls treats its horrors as something belonging to a distant time or an aberration of nature. There's also a slight trace of good old Victorian xenophobia, with Mark and Thornhill having run-ins with the locals in Madagascar and Sweeney's name hinting at a Scots-Irish origin. In the end, evil is uncovered and defeated by the proper authorities who restore order for the good people of society. Bond's play reflects the 1970s, rather more cynical view of the social order. Sweeney's crimes are a reflection of the crimes done to him through moral hypocrisy and the abuse of power. Sondheim and Wheeler take the notion a step further and suggest that evil is something endemic to human nature, and which we all participate in in one way or another. After all, the bloody doings in Fleet Street are fueled as much by the insatiable appetites of Mrs. Lovett's customers as by Sweeney's razor kind of gives new meaning to the phrase no ethical consumption under capitalism.